Hello, and welcome to the 2023 Forbes Equal Pay Day Forum. Before we begin, we would like to send a special thank you to our presenting partner, Glassdoor. Now to open the program, please welcome Sherry Phillips, CRO Forbes. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. We are so excited to be celebrating our third annual Equity Pay Day Summit and have you all here to have these open and honest conversations about equal pay and our progress and how we can convene together and all of you individually and collectively as stakeholders in this conversation. So again, thank you so much. I am Sherry Phillips, I'm the Chief Revenue Officer. I've been at Forbes for almost 27 years. Um, and in that 27 years, I have seen a lot of progress, even though in some moments we don't feel like we have. Um, and certainly the pandemic did not help a lot of us feel that there's a lot of positive progress and movement forward. But hopefully today we'll shine a light on some of those conversations and get inspired here. Um, but this is a topic that's very dear to Forbes. In fact, last week we were in all over the globe celebrating International Women's Day. We were in Abu Dhabi celebrating our 3050 summit, which had speakers like Hillary Clinton, Billie Jean King, uh, Gloria Steinem, and also the First Lady, Lena Olinsky. And thank you, it was, it was so incredible. So thank you for clapping. It was, it was a pinch me moment in my 27 year career. Um, but to have female leadership like that talking about progress and what we need to do to encourage others for change. It was quite remarkable. And then at the same time, we were hosting an event in Mexico City celebrating women and agents of change in Mexico City. So we really are um, passionate about this topic and also realize that that topic does begin at home. We know at Forbes that we have work to do um, in, this, in this very area. And Glassdoor, who is our amazing sponsor, um, they just put out some incredible research, which Bonnie will talk about later, but really only 4% of companies are meeting equitable goals. So there's lots of work for all of us to do in this space and we know it and that's why we're here. But um, I do wanna address that some of our colleagues were outside um, you know, talking about equal pay. Um, and with that in mind, I, I just wanna acknowledge this group that's convened and um, they are members of the News Guild of New York and like many newsrooms around um, the country, ours decided to unionize, and Forbes respects this decision. Um, we are negotiating with the Guild in good faith, and we're looking forward to arriving to a collective bargaining and agreement with our colleagues. So again, we take this very seriously. We do know that it begins at home, um, and soon enough you'll, you'll hear um, from Moira Forbes who is a dear friend and colleague of mine. Um, she started Forbes Women over 15 years ago, um, and the work that she's done in this space has been tireless, um, but really advocating for change and helping all of us have a voice, whether it's through our careers or balance or finding our own self-success. Um, but I also wanna acknowledge um, that tonight, today you're gonna hear from so many leaders um, that are doing such great and important work. And it's such an honor and privilege to be here with them. Um, and we really couldn't do this without Glassdoor. They are doing incredible work, which you'll hear from later um, from Bonnie. And I know some of our colleagues are here today. So thank you for being here. Um, so with that, I just wanna welcome everyone. Um, and uh, please. You are all stakeholders, as I mentioned, both individually and collectively, and welcome and enjoy this evening. Thank you. And now for Change Makers in Action, please welcome to the stage Lavia Jai Jones, best selling author, speaker, and multimedia entrepreneur. Diane von Furstenberg, fashion designer, philanthropist, and author. And moderator Moira Forbes, president and publisher, Forbes Women and EVP Forbes. 
Hello, everyone. Good evening. Sherry, thanks so much for those introductory remarks. I'm so grateful that all of you joined us this evening. I know many people are also watching um, across our social channels on Forbes. This is a really important and timely conversation. As we know, March is a month, uh, a really important so month, be month because it puts an intense spotlight on the need to really press for progress and drive change around issues related to um, equity and pay equity you know, obviously is a cornerstone to that conversation. In the next session later this evening, we're gonna talk about some of those structural barriers, what organizations and policies can be done inside organizations. But this conversation is really focused on how do each of us have the opportunity to leverage our own voices and our own platforms for change, whether it be to advocate for ourselves or to advocate for other women, whether it be, again, with equal pay or to be able to drive progress in issues that are meaningful to us. So with that, I'm very excited that the two women to my left are joining me. They are entrepreneurs and activists and writers, and two people have really committed themselves in meaningful ways to championing women and ensuring that future generations of women have extraordinary opportunities ahead of them. So thank you, ladies, very much for joining us this evening. Thank you for having us. I mean, really, really, two, two powerhouses. So, Diane, I, I want to start with you because, you know, we're, we're talking about, late this evening, I said, structural changes and, and how, to, how to drive change inside organizations. But as we know, with movements and, and the ability to, to push, oftentimes that requires an individual and a community to ignite that change. And oftentimes that requires a confidence or a sense of purpose to really move that forward. A lot of the conversations we have around women and leadership does center around this, this topic of, of confidence and how do you harness and hone it on behalf of yourself and others. You have many, many mantras in your lexicon um, around owning it and, and um, being in charge. I would love for you to share with the group your own confident journey, confidence journey as it relates to your career. Have you always been a confident entrepreneur and a voice in the broader landscape? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, when I started 50 years ago, I mean, the word entrepreneur was just not not there. I think confidence, um, um, well, I think you have to start from where you were born. Um, my mother was very, very strong. My mother was a, a true survivor of the Holocaust. She spent 14 months in concentration camps. By the time she was liberated, she weighed 49 kilos. She was a skeleton amongst ashes. But she came back. And um, her parents couldn't believe that she was back. And her mother fed her like a bird a little bit every five minutes. So she grew back to be normal. She was always very tiny. And uh, <clears throat> her, six months later, her fiance came back from Switzerland where he had spent the war, and uh, they got married. And, uh, but the doctors were adamant that she could not have a child for the next three years because she would not survive mm. and her child would not be normal. Well, sure enough, I was born nine months later. <laughs> <laughs> and I was not normal. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was... Life um, pushed me out, mm. I, you know, so um, I was not supposed to be born. I was not wanted. I was not any of that. But life, it was like a shoot, a green shoot mm. that came out of the ashes. And therefore, my, just my birth was a triumph mm. over misery. Mm. And... Therefore, I mean, I ne of course, all this time that I was growing up until very recently, I didn't realize any of that. But now I do. And, and so, in a weird way, the minute I was born, I had already won. Mm. So anything that happened after that was a plus. Mm. You know? It was really triumph over misery. Okay. 
So my mother was clearly very strong. And, and she didn't, the two things she taught me is that fear is not an option. Mm. She would never allow me to be afraid. If I was afraid of the dark, she would lock me in a closet. <laughs> Today she would go to jail for that. <laughs> <laughs> but as a result, she made me not fear. And the other thing she said is no matter what, you cannot be a victim, ever. Mm. And in order not to be a victim, you have to be true to yourself. Because if you are true to yourself, it's a lot of work. You can't be delusional. You have to be really hard on yourself and all of that. But you're free. Even if you're in jail, you're free if you're true to yourself. So those were the things that were kind of, you know, tattooed deep, deep, deep into me. So. I didn't realize any of that, but I guess that it gave me, uh, I, just, I, just, I just threw myself into it and kept designing my life, not knowing, learning, and, and to this day, I'm still doing that, which is insane. You know, 50 years later, I'm 76 years old, I am, still doing that, and I'm still learning, and I'm still reading, and I'm thinking to myself, why am I doing that? <laughs> and, uh, but I think it's about honoring life, mm. and, and practicing gratitude. Mm. So that has nothing to do with your conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but, it ex you know, everyone has a different story where you find confidence. And, and then, then, by accident, I ended up working in fashion. I worked for this friend of mine who had the, the factory and he invented this jersey fabric and one thing led to the next. And I invented this little dress. And that little dress is I wanted to be a woman in charge, and I became a woman in charge because of that little dress. Mm -hmm. And because it was a little dress, I would share it, I would travel all around, wrapping people around. And I, the more I was successful, the more confident I was, and I was sharing that confidence with the dress. What I love about that dress is it became really the shorthand for confidence it, in, in terms of what it represented, but also the, the cultural zeitgeist as well. And I, and I think the conversation around fear and sense of self is, is a really important one as it relates to finding your, your place in the world, understanding your value, advocating for yourself and, and others. And Lavi, you've talked a lot about the fact that fear can evaporate confidence and Look how you beautiful. <laughs> so, so, first yes. of all, Diane Von First of all, Call Me Beautiful is a there, highlight of my there life. There you go. Y'all go ahead, tweet we're, that. Thank we're you. Done, um, we're done, ladies and gentlemen. No, um, <laughs> but, uh, but I love that because you've also talked about the fact that um, in order to drive change, we need to be comfortable with the uncomfortable, that we need to really lean into the things that we fear, um, not because we will not fear them, but because on the other side is, is opportunity. And that's you know, something that I think resonates with the theme of this evening. And, and I'll say one thing I love about Lovey is, is one of her titles is professional troublemaker. Absolutely. Which, which I, my son, I was with my seven-year-old son last night preparing for this, and he saw this, and he's like, Mom, professional troublemaker? He's like, I can be that? I was like, yeah. Like, like, yeah, you already are. Yeah, um, but, so um, you will remember. I, I, yeah, I will remember it. I just no, don't want him to be, I don't want him to remember that. <laughs> like, not right, not, not right now. Um, but, but you called yourself a professional troublemaker. You called also that in the context of your experience with Equal Pay in 2017 with a, with a tech conference you, you attended. What does it mean to be a professional troublemaker? And what does I it mean that. to create good trouble, as you call it? I've basically created a life being a professional troublemaker. I you love know. that. My second New York Times bestselling book is called Professional Troublemaker because I really wanted to reclaim what it meant. When we hear making trouble, you hear being a nuisance. You hear you know, being the person that people don't want to see in the room. But I consider a professional troublemaker somebody who is necessary in every room. Because to live in a deeply unjust world, when you make 
professional trouble, good trouble, it means you're somebody who's fighting against the status quo, That's which right. is injustice. Like, we're here because women get paid so little, exactly. right, compared to men. To be a professional troublemaker is to also be somebody who's elevating and disrupting that. In what ways are we using the powers that we have in whatever room that we are in to shift the world? We often think about like making an impact about, you know, writing twenty thousand dollar checks or protesting or, you know, volunteering eighty five hours. But how do you change the world when you don't start by changing the room that you are in first? And that's what it means to be a professional troublemaker. My ca my career, you know grew because I was a person who was saying what people were thinking but dared not to. My blog grew because people were like, you are the voice in my head that I'm afraid to say out loud. And uh, I talk about how, like, for me, my confidence came in my Nigerianness. You know, I don't know if y'all have ever met Nigerian people. We are really bravado. <laughs> we walk not into that. every room like we can own it. It's because I was watching my grandmother when I was growing up. That woman who didn't have a high school diploma walked into any room as if she owned it. She took up space without apology. So when we talk about making good trouble and being a professional troublemaker, I see that as being the person who's in the room who is challenging a joke that's not funny because it's not inclusive, it's insensitive, being like, mm, I'm not a fan of that. You know, it's the coworker who says, let's rethink this campaign idea because I don't think it's that thoughtful. I think we can do better than this. It's being the friend who says, let's have a tough conversation. So for me, my career being a public speaker, being a writer, being a voice of some sort, which happened accidental. I was just writing out loud as if nobody was reading, people were, um, has unfolded because of that. I commit to saying what feels tough, even when I'm afraid. So that's a piece about the fear of it all. But are you really afraid? What, am I really afraid? Absolutely. I'm a black woman in the United States. You know, to the point of the piece that you talked about in Forbes, so the first thing that was ever written about me in Forbes was in 2017, and it was because I was asked to speak at a conference in Europe. They came and meet to meet. It was like, we'd love for you to speak. And when, you know, my speaker's agent went back to them, they were like, oh, we can't pay her. We think the exposure will be really great for her. I said, clearly I'm exposed because y'all came to me. <laughs> I, I'm already exposed, thank you. And because I'm a, uh, I'm a part of a network of, the w of women in business and media and tech called The List, I went in there and was like, hey, has anybody ever asked to speak at this conference? And in 15 minutes, I realized that that conference paid white men to come. Women, they paid, white women, they will pay their travels. For black women who were asked to speak, we were asked to just pay your own way. You had to spend money wow. to speak for them. So I was like, ooh, in that moment, I was afraid because I realized that who am I, who do I say I am, in public and in private? Do I say something publicly and face possible financial loss? Because if other conferences are like, oh gosh, she said something about that, they might unbook me or whatever. And I was like, you know what? In this moment, I have to be that person that I say I am. And so? Because who am I to expect the intern to speak up? So me, who's been speaking for so 10 years. So what did years, you do? Well, I took to Twitter. I went to Twitter. And I talked about how this conference invited me and how they expected me to, to, to pay. Everybody who had been invited started talking also. And it turned into a, like a really big conversation around the pay and equality, especially in tech, and how they especially don't respect black women. So a friend who actually worked for Forbes was like, would you be willing to go on the record to talk about this? And my speaker's edge was like, oh, Lord. <laughs> But I was like, this is when we have to make the best That's type of right. trouble. This is when we have to use our privilege and our power. That's right. So I actually spoke up about it. The piece was written. The person who invited me to speak, who owned the conference, because he saw two women challenging him, one white woman, one black woman, felt his ego hit, replied to the Forbes writer, and CC'd me on it to, for further dog whistle and said, well, since this conference is in Amsterdam, maybe Lovey can command her fee if it was in a more urban city which was printed in the Forbes piece, amen? <laughs> so in that moment, I put a lot on the line. As a black woman who was opinionated, who knows that I face higher consequences and the stakes are always higher for me, I was absolutely afraid about what I could stand to lose, but I had to think to myself, what do you also stand to either gain? And if you do have that apocalypse scenario, can you fix it 
or can you move past it? And now you can talk about it all the time. All the time, but I don't have to because it's on Forbes. <laughs> As is everything, no. Um, but but, but love you, what, I, what I love that you talk about is the fact that it's not the absence of fear, it's, it's leaning into the conversation and asking yourself after the fact whether you would feel comfortable not having used your voice. And, and what yes. I love about both of you is, is the pen has been mightier than the sword, and it really is the power of the voice, either individually or collectively that can be harnessed in extraordinary ways, whether it be on Twitter, in this room, one-on-one -on -one conversations. Moira, to, to one be... of the questions that I think I want to offer people for those moments that are really, really hard, that you are like, I know there might be something on the line, ask yourself, will my silence convict me? Will my silence convict That's me? That's a good one. If the answer is yes, you got to say the thing because you're going to be sitting on this thing. You're going to be thinking about it. It's gonna, you're going to dream about it. You're going to be sitting in the meeting regretting your inaction. Will my silence convict me and will my inaction make me proud? And the other thing is that <clears throat> the other thing is that those bad moments in life yeah. where you get humiliated or you get whatever, those are the best anecdotes when you're invited to speak. Mm, a good story. Good. Yes. If, if anything bad in life happens, if you get a good story out of it, then, no, then it's, it's no, then it's, it's not worth about it. a good story. It's <laughs> a story about that connects. it's about you know the vulnerability is what people react the most with. Yes. You know? Yes. So anytime I have a friend of mine who gets a bad story in the in the you know or written or something a big moment of humiliation, first of all, it's the it's the best time to show your friendship mm -hmm. and, and to know, and not to say I feel sorry for, for them, but just turn it around and say, keep it, because this will be your best anecdote when you do your t tech talk. <laughs> <laughs> Facts. And, and, and your vulnerability is, yeah. is also where your power come from, comes totally. from. D Diane, you also talk about the power of, of words and the power of a voice. You say the most important thing is, is to use your voice. Um, when we spoke a couple of years ago, you said when you have a voice, it's your duty, but it's also your gift and your privilege to use it for people who do not have a voice. Can you share mm -hmm. any advice or lessons you've learned around how to most effectively use your voice on behalf of others? Well, when you get older, it's the great thing about age is you get away with everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but using, a vo using your voice is, I mean, the minute you have a little bit of a voice, yeah. it is so useful. Uh, it makes you feel good, it makes other people feel good. And when you realize that owning it is, is you know, is your vulnerability turns into strength. Mm -hmm. your, you know, and that is the thing that is so interesting. And, and, and that's what people remember, you know? And that's also what people associate with you with. I mean, okay, they read that you're successful, but so what? I mean, you know, they don't relate to that. And, but they do relate to you were humiliated, you felt small, you were rejected, all of that. And the minute you share that, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just a wonderful trick. And it is about using your voice. Mm -hmm. And um, everyone has a voice, actually. But, you know, in some cases, you can't really use it uh, until you do. <laughs> yeah, no, that's real. And I think... Here's the thing about everyone not having a voice, too. We all have voices. Some of it has just been taken away from us. Yeah. Which is why, for those of us who take up space in the room, sometimes the space that we need to take up is to give somebody else the mic, is to That's right. let somebody else step into the That's space right. that we have. So that is what it really means to use your power, That's right. is to loan it to somebody else That's and right. say, you know what, since you're going to listen to me, who can I make you listen to? That's right. I, I want to touch on that a little bit more because I, I, I love how you talk about this concept of loaning your power. First, you say that, that community obviously offers strength in numbers, but um, community means that you have to show up. Community is a verb. You talked about the importance of loaning your courage, your voice, and your currency to other women. What does that actually mean to loan your currency to other women? 
it means serving as backup in a room. Has everybody ever been in a meeting where afterwards, after you said something, somebody came up to you and was like, I'm so glad you said that. Those are micro appreciations and nobody needs them. If you could not use your voice or your currency for me as backup in the room, keep it. If you could not say, hey, I, I support what she just said. I, I think that's, that's actually really smart and thoughtful because one person can be ignored easily. Two, three, four, five are harder to ignore. So when you're the person who only speaks up when nobody's watching, your voice in that moment, your power in that moment is being null and void because you didn't use it when it was most critical and to the person who needed you the most. I think as women, especially in a world that is often not created to honor us, when we show up in the room, being able to show up for each other is critical because then we stop each other from being interrupted. We are sharing information so we can actually have a frame of reference because I believe the systems of oppression that really are successful, are successful because our silence is used and weaponized. And those moments when we go after somebody, after a tough moment when they felt like they stood on an island by themselves, that hurts because you go, oh, so you actually agreed and you didn't even show up for me? I would have actually rather just thought you disagreed with me and been like, well, I, hey, I was the only one who thought this. So I just really want us to show up Sisterhood is a verb, and that's an action word, right? We talk about allyship all the time. We don't really need any more allies. We need accomplices. And that means you put your skin in the game. It means you come here with me, stand on the island with me. So it's two, not just one. So that's how we start showing up in every single room, every single day. It's not you writing a big check. It's not you taking to LinkedIn or social media and saying the thing. What are you doing at the table that you are at to the people who can touch you and who know your name? In what ways are you being an enabler of their winning in that room? And I think more of us doing that changes the game. It stops being extraordinary. And women also have something called seduction, right? Mm. I, think, <coughs> I think women have to Do think. all women have seduction? Yes. Okay. Uh, I that think well. that women have, women is about solution and seduction, right? Mm. When Can you define seduction? No, for, let's go for, to solution first. I mean, <laughs> let you know, if there is a fire, the most submissive, most abused woman, all of a sudden she wakes up, gets the children, get the jewelry off the door, right? <laughs> women are like, in moments of danger, women show their, their, that solution. Mm -hmm. Okay, so women have a tendency to be very pragmatic, yeah. very practical, because they do so many roles and they have so many things happen to their body and all of that. We used to manage, we're a better manager. So the solution is there. Then the second thing is the seduction. So seduction doesn't mean necessarily showing your legs, although if you have good ones, you can. <laughs> but, but it is somehow convince, you know, dealing with a solution and convincing the others that it's their idea. Mm -hmm. That's seduction. You don't like it? Here's the thing. <laughs> I am a fan of seduction, but in that term, I don't want to sit in a room where somebody else has to take my idea and I have to sit there and watch it happen. No, oh, oh, I see what See what mean. I'm saying? Yeah. But, so, no, 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 but it's not, yeah, I see what you mean, but what I mean is you have a solution. Yes. And so maybe you don't want it to be their idea, Word. but make them embrace, why? I mean. Collaboration. Yeah. Absolutely. I but think collaboration is. Flattery is fine. You oh, absolutely. Them. I'm a fan make of flattery. Them make them believe it's your idea as long as you got the solution. Most of my friends, I met most of my friends because I told them their shoes were fire. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I was like, girl, yes. And then we end up having a whole friendship. I agree. I think that collaboration in that way is really important. Anyway, I bet you one thing. Yes. Okay? At some point in the near future, yeah. you're going to be talking to somebody, yeah. and you will hear my little voice saying that. <laughs> if, I hear so if it happens, will you tell me? Absolutely. Okay, great. I got you. <laughs> do, do we all have a little Diane on our shoulder? Just yeah, well, we'll hear that in the future. Well, well as we wrap up, I, I, again, both of you, these were really 
powerful insights, and what I loved is, is, is also sort of very practical insights that I think can not only reframe how we think about things in our own daily lives, but but really sort of advice um, and things that we can implement ourselves and, and to others. So my last question for, for each of you, I love the word troublemaker. Um, what advice, I'll start with you, Diane, what advice would you give to an aspiring troublemaker? Go for it and enjoy the ride. <laughs> I love that. Um, my advice would be to remember that uh, fear is real, fear is gonna be present, but I want you to choose courage because in the absence of fear, there is no courage. If it was easy, everybody would do it. So, you know, make a habit of choosing courage, especially in those moments when you're afraid. But also fear has to be put aside. Yes. You deal with the same, the same issue, yes. but if you put the emotion aside, mm -hmm. oh, I have a trick. <laughs> when you go through something that you're afraid, try to push it aside and look at it, whatever you're doing, as a documentary. Mm. Which means you detach yourself a little bit mm. from the emotion and you go through the motion. I love that. I love that. Word. I'll be, I'll be living in documentary mode for, for the next couple of weeks. Well, ladies, thank you. I've, there were so many great insights shared. I just ask each of you if there's one or two things this evening that you are taking away from these extraordinary women, please pay that forward. Please share it with others because we're so fortunate and privileged to have the chance to, to learn from these amazing women, but to learn from the extraordinary women in this room. So if there is something that has stuck with you or resonated, I just ask that you pay it forward because the ripple effect of this type of conversation can be far more powerful than any of us can even appreciate here tonight. So Diane, love you. Thank, thank you. you so much. And thank, thank you to all of you. You're ready to make a career change, but how do you know where to go? With Glassdoor, you can see what it's like inside from leadership teams. What do you say we give ourselves another raise? <laughs> to pay. I'm getting peanuts. And get all the information you need from the people who know. Our group earns 12% above industry average. Oh. Glassdoor. Find a job that loves you back. And now for the conversation Closing the Gap, please welcome to the stage Bonnie Chirazi, Director of Market Insights, Glassdoor. Reshma Saujani, founder Girls Code, and founder and CEO Moms First. And moderator Diane Brady, assistant managing editor, communities and leadership, Forbes. Hello, everybody, and um, thank you for joining us. I have to start by saying that that debate that Lovey and Diane had about seduction reminded me of chapter seven of Dale Carnegie, Make the Other Guy Think It's His Idea. And the two biggest fans of that were Charlie uh, Manson and I believe uh, Warren Buffett. So you can use these skills for good or for ill. Now we're gonna talk about women since we've cleared that out of the way, but I think that was fascinating how you get things done. I wanna start with a, a personal story. I wanna ask both of you how this issue resonates with you personally. I'm gonna start at the end. Bonnie, with you. All right, hi everybody. Uh, for me, working at Glassdoor, this really resonates with me because part of my job is helping people find a job and a salary they love. So I love watching people get paid. But in a more real life example, I've found pay equity to be a really sneaky issue. It's not as simple as you would think. So. There was a time when I was in a room with a whole group of managers, really well-meaning. I respected every single one. And we were discussing promoting two candidates, male, female. They both crushed their goals. They were both really well-liked by their teams. But the managers in the group were concerned about how they use their time and how they use resources. And after discussing it, the man was going to be promoted in spite of the way he used resources. And the woman was not going to be promoted because of the way she used resources. And I was so nervous, but I asked them, is that fair to her? Are we holding her to a higher standard? And the outcome was that they both got promoted. And it's just, I, when I think about this issue, I think about the sneakiness of it and how you just have to be ready to tackle it the moment you see it. 
When, and when, you, when you say how they used resources, I'm immediately thinking of you know expense accounts. You mean something different? Mostly, just time, mostly. Okay. Yeah. So how much time they took how to get the How much time and it. effort, yeah, was applied. And the woman was being penalized for it? Yes. It okay. was exactly the same, basically the same for each of them. They were just working really, really hard to accomplish their goals, led to them accomplishing their goals, but also maybe some burnout, too. And speaking up made a difference. How about for you? Yeah, I mean, I mean, at Moms First, my movement that I'm running now, one of our one of our missions is to you know get rid of the motherhood penalty. So you know, fathers make a six percent premium when they become a dad, and moms lose four percent of their income for every child that they have. A lot of money. How right? much do we lose? Four percent. Okay. Yep, for every kid. Mother of three. And a lot of money. <laughs> Don't do the math, right? Um, so we had a call out to our community because a reporter was like, what are some of those stories? And like my inbox was flooded with DMs from moms who had a story of how they've been discriminated against the minute they become a mother. And one of those stories was, was a mom who had left the workforce for six years when she had her children, wanted to reenter, hadn't lost her brain, right? And as she was applying and, you know, she got the offer, but they basically said to her, well, we would have paid you more if you hadn't taken that time off. Mm -hmm. And so it was just, again, I think a very clear example of how society and employers view caretaking and how we are constantly penalized for it. And you, you can never make up the financial loss. Can, can you, before we go to some of the data, which I think is very powerful, can you tell us a bit more about what Moms First is for those who aren't familiar with it and what your mission is? Yeah, so I um, spent the past years building my organization, Girls Who Code. And in the p pandemic, I found myself you know, homeschooling my five-year-old, taking care of my newborn. And when the pandemic hit, I essentially, you know, had to save my nonprofit from being shut down. And there were two things that I saw in, that really kind of moved me to step down as CEO and launch my new organization, Moms First. The first thing were my students. You know, half the girls we teach are black and brown, and so many of them um, are caretakers. And a lot of them were on their way to major in computer science, but their mothers were essential workers. So instead of going to college, they had to stay home and take care of their siblings. So you really saw the two-generational cycle of poverty that happens because we refuse to fix the broken structure of care. You know, the second thing is most of my leadership team were all moms of young children. And the implications of living in a country, the only industrialized nation that doesn't have paid leave, the implications of living in a country that doesn't have affordable childcare, where 40% of parents today are in debt because of pre-K. The implications of living in a country, you know, that basically pays moms less. We often, most of us, work to work. And because of this, you saw 11 million women leave the workforce overnight. And no one did anything about it. And so I am now on a mission uh, to get paid leave, affordable child care, you know, in, in as many places and spaces by 2027. I think, you know, Diane and Lovely had an amazing conversation about the fact that, like, I often think that when we as women decide we've had enough, it will be done. But we have to decide that enough is enough. And, and we're, and you know. talk about it, right? I mean, so, fine, before I, I want to talk about data, and I have to share that, you know, I started my career pre-Glassdoor, and I vividly remember working at a place, I think it rhymed with Mall Meat Journal. I don't want to, <laughs> I shall not, but I got a phone call offering me 40% more pay. I went into my boss's office and said, I just got offered 40% more pay. He said, well, we'll match it. And I was like, wait, it's that easy? It, it's just I didn't know what the baseline was. So talk about the data that you're seeing, because that's where we share it, is Glassdoor, and that's where you get to see what's really going on. Yeah, so some recent research from Glassdoor, we found that only about one out of five women have negotiated their pay in the last 12 months, and that's significantly fewer than their male counterparts. And looking at the Glassdoor data, we can't really, um, can't really speak to the salary side, but we are seeing that women aren't having an equal experience in the workplace. So in our recent um, equity x-ray research that Glassdoor released, we found that among companies where there was a significant difference between uh, men and women in the workplace, women were having a much worse experience in the workplace. And so that means it's bigger than just pay equity. 
women aren't having equal opportunities in the workplace because of the workplace really just isn't designed for women. And among all those companies included in that survey, only 4% were rated equitable across both gender and race ethnicity variables. 4%? 4%. Okay. So it's something that where there's a lot of opportunity for all employers to make some big gains. It's, it, like one of the things that's interesting in the data I saw is that we're half as likely to talk about our pay. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts as to why that is? I mean, I don't talk about my pay to colleagues. I don't know any, to me, it, maybe it's about you just don't, it's embarrassing perhaps, you well, don't know where you fit, you don't know how you'll be viewed by your managers. A lot of women don't talk about their pay with their colleagues or in the workplace because there's negative social consequences for doing that. So you could be perceived as greedy or not a team player if you think that the company's money belongs, more of it belongs to you than somewhere else. And so it's not that it doesn't occur to women because actually just Barely over 50% of women are satisfied with their salary and benefits at their current company. So they're obviously aware that they're not happy with their pay. We but they're a show of hands. Who's happy with their yeah. pay? No, okay. Who's happy with after, their pay? After we've had a drink, <laughs> drink afterwards, we'll do that. And I but think beyond that, too, I mean, 41% of America's breadwinners are women. 70% of black women are both the sole caregiver and the sole provider. So this isn't simply just about also like, oh my God, I don't want to ask for more. Like we need to put food on the table. What's interesting is what you saw during the pandemic. And the, you know, this was supposed to be a golden moment where finally you could work from home, right? You could see the kids. It's like, oh, there's your kid. How nice. Let's continue with the meeting. But we saw more women drop out in a period when you'd think it's like we finally got some degree of at least the flexibility that we wanted. What do you think happened? I mean, I think that the reality is, is that two thirds of the caregiving work is done by women. So we are both doing two and a half jobs, both being a mother and being a worker in the workforce. And like you said, workplaces have never been designed for us. Basic things like the work day is nine to five and the school day is eight to three, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that what happened in the pandemic is for a minute, we got to see our kids and we got to work and our productivity didn't change. And I think people were tolerant of it. Uh, you know, 40% of companies increased their benefits like paid leave and affordable childcare. But the minute we started moving out of the pandemic, all of a sudden our kids bumping into Zoom was real annoying. And they made it very clear. Every single CEO from Jamie Dimon, you know, to the list oh, get goes back on, to get back to the office. Get back to work. Mm -hmm. What are you all doing? You're watching Netflix and just chilling. They don't want to go in alone. Well, no, I think the reality <laughs> is, is that the, the thing that they're not considering is that half of our daycare centers are still shut down. So we don't have child care. So until we decide as a country to stop seeing this as a personal problem but an economic issue and that women are a must-have and not a nice-to-have, mm -hmm. we need flexibility. We need workplaces to look differently. So we have to have a radically different conversation than we're having. What do you, do you want to add to that? I mean, because I think one of the things we saw, certainly more um, women of color that yeah. were, uh, that they had a worse time. And so I think a part of it is that challenge too with remote work that is the visibility issue and that negotiation part. So it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword because I know people who are remote often find it harder too to, to do the negotiation, to know what their career path is and yet you want to be flexible, so. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all women don't experience pay equity the same way. So for example, black women make about 65 cents to the dollar compared to their white male counterparts, and Hispanic women are making about 55 cents to the dollar compared to their white male counterparts. And women in general are 82 cents. So it's not, it's already not equal. And it almost and, induces existential angst, isn't it? Like, yeah. at this rate, 314 years from now, like, you hate those conversations. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk about the levers, and I want to give a slight shout. You're an investor as well, and I have to say that one of the companies you invest in is here. Hey, Mirza, where, there, there you are. So that's, uh, because I want to put on a hat as, as head of talent. What would you say to me is something I could be doing you know, we're talking to individuals right now, but let's say you're in a gatekeeper role. What can, what can be done? I mean, I think the reality is, is that, um, well, first of all, I, I joke that it's not that hard to fix the pay gap. Like, one of my Girls Who Code students can build you an algorithm tomorrow. You know what I mean? <laughs> Simply just audit your payroll, period. Like, we act like this is, like, rocket science. It's not. We, there's a reluctance to do it because we don't think, we don't value the labor 
in the same way. We, mm -hmm. we literally think that the minute you become a mother, you're, you're just not as valuable. And so that's a societal shift that we have to change. The second thing is a lot of these, you know, these structures are quite frankly broken. The model of childcare in America is broken, period, just from a business model perspective. So we have to be making more investments in FamTech. I think a great example of how I think about this is climate change. FamTech, I actually haven't heard that FamTech. term. I've heard FemTech, now there's FamTech, Fam -tech. Fam -tech. Okay. Tech. So, you know, part of how we have to think about this is the way that we thought about climate 30 years ago. When we asked you to recycle 30 years ago, we thought there were all these businesses said, that's bad for capitalism, right? We're going to lose a lot of money if we, if we start thinking about our climate. The tune has changed now. Most venture capitalists are investing in climate, quite frankly, because we learned that you can actually make money from doing good in climate. The same thing needs to happen here. We can actually make money from investing in families. You know, and we need to have more businesses in child care, you know what I mean, in, in, in paid leave and thinking about how we're investing in the family. Like that is actually good for business. No so, one's asking anyone to do anything for So think for creatively about some of the tools out there, perhaps. See it as an economic issue, period. And, and when you think about it, so Bonnie, think about it from an, from an economic standpoint. We're actually in tough times, at least certainly in tech, right? We're seeing layoffs in tech. I've certainly read that women are more likely to be laid off. And people of color. And people of color. So in, in times like this, um, what are you seeing? Because with inflation, too, if anything, the gap risks getting worse, right? Yeah, I think it's a little too early to tell what the, what the damage is going to be right now. But you know, historically, these kinds of circumstances don't bode well for women in the workplace. Are you I seeing mm -hmm. legislation make a difference since we have you know, all yeah. this pay, you know, some of it's like we pay between 80,000 and 300 and you're like, what? No, but I mean, it's, yeah. is that, it does seem to be making a difference, doesn't yes. it? Yes, the pay transparency laws are, are making a really important difference. And on Glassdoor, we're noticing about half of the jobs posted on Glassdoor now have a pay range attached. And it's over two thirds of the jobs in um, California, Washington, Colorado, and New York who have stricter pay transparency laws. So I think that's really promising because now job seekers are entitled to know what the pay band is before they negotiate their salary so that they can they yeah. can get fair pay. And Diane, I do think we do, know, we were talking about this earlier, yeah. right? I think we do see what's happening and it's actually a global trend. You know, there was an article in Bloomberg last week that, you know, Gen Xers are basically leaving the workforce in senior positions at five times the rates, the highest loss of flight essentially from managerial positions. You work at a law to firm, what? you work at a bank. To start their own companies or to, who go knows? to Bali? No, I, mean, I don't even think it's going to Bali. I think people are downshifting. Yeah. So they're going to part-time work. They're becoming consultants because you cannot disconnect the pay gap with the mental toll that most mothers and parents, quite frankly, yeah. feel. To, it's too much. And you're seeing a global trend. So all the progress that we've, quite frankly, made you know, the fact that 44% of, you know, Fortune 100 companies, like, we've made a lot of progress in the last 10 years. We've lost it all. Mm -hmm. and, and, we, and, and again, it's not rocket science. It's fixing broken structures, pay equity, affordable child care, paid leave. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's not complicated. And quite frankly, it's not like it's unconscionably expensive. Right? You're going to actually make the money back in terms of retention, in terms of you know, sick days that people are not going to be taking. It, it makes economic sense. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned Gen X. I want to ask about Gen Z, because we know we always make all kinds of predictions about this next generation coming in. What are you saying? Bonnie, what are you seeing? Are you, can you break it down demographically? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have any glass door specific insights on Gen Z, but I do have sort of a passion for generational research as a millennial who's been beaten up by <laughs> pop culture oh, <laughs> research. I'm Gen X, just ignore But so far what I'm seeing with Gen Z is that they do tend to go to the office more. So in terms of showing up and looking for those opportunities for mentorship. Where's my mentor? She's back. Yeah, home. they're there. Their mentors tend to be the ones who stay home, so that's on them. But I think they bring up a lot of good points around how much they really should be working because they're just figuring it out. But in my personal experience, every Gen Z I've worked with has been incredible. So I, I, don't, I think well, there's a lot of just pop culture battling happening Let's there. talk about tactics because I always remember it was very powerful for me when I learned that women negotiate twice and men negotiate. I can't remember if it was 11 times or, you know, 18, who knows. But that gave me permission to ask more than once. What tactics would you suggest to individuals knowing what you know, um, talking about it certainly, but some of the other um, you know, data that you've seen in terms of 
who's successful and why? Any thoughts? Well, when you're negotiating your pay and salary, I think the tips really depend on your unique situation. If you're in a psychologically safe environment and you have a good relationship with your manager and team, you know you have a manager that's going to go to bat for you, that's a fair conversation to have. You know, you can do your research on Glassdoor, you can find out what your what the average salary is for professionals like you and you can make your case. If you're in a place where you know there's not a lot of people like you on your team and maybe you don't have a close or you know, safe feeling relationship with your manager, having that conversation, there could be social costs to having it. And that's where sponsorship comes in key. So sponsorship is like a more activated allyship because like Lovey said, like we, we've got enough allies, you know, we have enough people who agree that pay equity should be fixed, but it's still not fixed. So sponsorship is for people who have more influence at work and have more power and have more privilege at work, can you, consider sponsoring a woman at work. And what that looks like is sticking up for her in meetings, backing her ideas, and helping pave the way and having some conversations with the people who do make the decisions about pay so that when she does have that conversation, it goes more smoothly and there's less, she's taking less of the right. social cost on herself. Go ahead, Rush. Can we never we're talk not, about... We're not supposed to no, lean I, in now. No, no, I just, I don't want to ever talk about sponsorship, mentorship, imposter syndrome, or anything that makes it feel like it's my fault that I don't know how to negotiate. Mm -hmm. That if I just learned this one little thing, then I would actually be paid equitably. There's a structural, systematic problem, period. We have to have a radically different conversation. It can't be your individual you know, uh, reason or fault or because you know, you, it's up to you to basically lift all of us up. Right. No. Like, it well, is, you it didn't is, ask it for a raise if you right. asked, I And if she you. asked for a raise and she asked for a raise, we would all be free. We are not free. We are, we are far from free. I think it is up to institutions and organizations, and this is where I think laws are important, mm -hmm. right? You know, federal laws, state laws, mandating the fact that there should not be pay discrimination based on gender, based on race, based on who you choose to love, you know what I mean? Based on the fact that you are a mother. And I think that is what we have to start advocating for. And every single book that you have on your shelf that teaches you how you should be a better negotiator, please throw it in the garbage <laughs> and refuse refuse to participate in any conversation that happens at work that is, makes you feel like you are the one that is broken. I totally agree with that. And I do think part of it, I mean, the biggest part is that the system's broken and that we're trying to, we're trying to have a successful career in a broken system that's not designed for us. Right. Totally, totally agree with that. I would say, though, that part of it is also normalizing having the conversations. The more we right. talk about it. In the it, interim, right? Because, you know, yeah, we can't. In the interim. It. Until, until the broken system yeah. is fixed. And I think that's where sponsorship comes in key because the people who know that they're being paid fairly, and they're like, I've done it. I've stood up. Uh, if you're a woman who's being paid fairly, you're like, I did it. So that's, that's one down. <laughs> it's like, you still have work to do. You still have to be vocal and help others yeah. until we do fix and, it. And no, I mean, listen, I do think that there are, and I've been thinking a lot about this, right? It's like, how do you, what are the things that I need to change about myself? Right? That I, and I, I think about this, quite frankly, in my own marriage, right? Like, what are the things that I need to do to okay, create equality? Okay, let's take equality? a moment to pause and right. talk about your marriage. No, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you were saying. I'm sure my husband loves like I do it all the time. But I'm saying that there are tactics. Like, for example, at Moms First right now, we are doing a challenge. Five weeks of putting Moms First. I mean, think about the fact that I joke that like MomsFirst.com was available because everyone thought it was too radical. The idea what of does putting that our mean, putting but, moms first. That's interesting. That's what I'm saying. The yeah. idea of putting ourselves first is so radical. Most of us don't do that, nor know how to do that. Nor we, because we live in a society that tells us it's selfish to do that. Whether it's going to a doctor's appointment, you know what I mean, or quite frankly, you know, advocating for paid leave. So I think that we have to get into a place where we're kind of building that muscle of learning how to put us first, so that when you are you know in a negotiation when you're about to accept a job it doesn't feel awkward for you to ask about or talk about salary mm -hmm. because we've been taught from the time that we're little that we should be nice and people pleasers and it's not nice to talk about money well, even company branding i'm fascinated you know maybe it's a, a glass door thing too but if there's a there is a talent shortage still regardless and you have all these this incredible pool of talent that's not happy where they are I'm surprised there aren't more companies that use this as a differentiator 
to say we this is what we do do for moms and dads perhaps I mean you think maybe you talk about it in the abstract but how many companies actually do an audit like that 4%, do they boast about it or do you just happen to find out through your research? I mean, we did a study with McKinsey that showed that basically moms are shopping, you know, parents are shopping for places that are family friendly because after the pandemic, you know, we realized that we want a different kind of life. Yeah. And so our partner companies like Synchrony Financial or Patagonia or Etsy or Kirkland, they are benefiting from having these types of policies. And so I think it is the trend that is going to continue to bear, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is a conversation that from when I talk to CEOs is happening in every single boardroom. I think the accelerator to that is us demanding that too. I wanna to give you an interesting example of that, IVF. You know, five years ago, most Fortune 100 companies did not offer fertility benefits. But when we went into interviews, women and men, you know, and said, well, what are your, how, are you paying for IVF? What's your egg freezing policy? HR would go back to, you know, the top brass and say, ooh, I think we gotta start offering these fertility benefits because everybody's asking for it. And it radically shifted, you know what I mean, to you know, the vast majority of companies offering some sort of benefits. The same thing can happen on childcare. The same thing can happen on gender neutral paid leave policies. But we have to, and this is your point about what is that we should be, what, 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 should we, what should we be asking for? are those types of benefits. And the egg freezing is interesting because it's also I mean like, you know, you could work till 40 and we'll let you freeze your eggs. I had a friend in banking who said, wait, are you telling me to freeze my eggs because you want me to not have kids well, for the night? But which I'm kidding. But it's, well, I was uh, talking to a MIT behavioral psychologist and he told me that it's, it, it's a scam because it takes 90 frozen eggs to have one baby. That's like seven IVFs that they have to pay That's for. That's a lot, yes. Wow. So let me, um, we're gonna do some quick lightning round last words and then I know we're gonna be going to you, Bonnie, for some final thoughts. So let me um, start with you, Bonnie, in terms of your own takeaway from this before you move on to mm -hmm. the last. Yeah, so I mean, my key takeaways are pay equity, again, sneaky issue. It's not just about how easy it is to pay everybody for equal work. It's about the opportunities and the way that women are treated in the workplace. Yeah. And I think the more we talk about it, especially the more we talk about pay and start normalizing having those conversations, the more we'll be able to kind of broaden our reach and start making that something that employers are more eager to talk about. Right. Kind of the same way that, you know, when employers started talking about culture and their culture and their employee experience. Now, every, every employer has a culture, every employer has, you know, employee experience. So I'm hopeful that it'll... Right. If we keep the conversation going. And we'll I'm going to give there. the last word to you, Reshma. I mean, I, look, I think we have to have a radically different conversation that's about fixing structure and not mm -hmm. fixing women. Uh, and that is very new. And it's hard. And it's going to be hard because, again, we've been socialized to basically have this gender equality conversation in a very different way. And I think the second thing is, is to, this is an economic issue. No one's doing you a favor. We simply, women simply cannot work if they do not have childcare. You know, if they go back to work 10 days after having a baby, which the vast majority of women do. So we have this enormous opportunity, I think. Again, not to mention the fact that we're living in a moment where our reproductive rights have been taken away. And six out of 10 women who have abortions are mothers. And they're, having, you know, they're seeking to have their reproductive rights protected because they can't afford to have another child. So we're forcing birth in a country that doesn't have paid leave and that doesn't have childcare. And that is our, to me, that is the moment that all of you need to, all of us need to rise up to. This is our right. time. I can't think of a better place to stop than there with one second left. So please join me in thanking uh, our two panelists. <laughs>Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to have just a few more minutes with you all to close us out here. So um, to be honest, I struggled with the best way to use this time today. Option one, I thought we could talk about some of the progress we've made and how you could better advocate for yourself. And option two, I could tell you something you prob probably already know. Decided to go with option two because I found myself saying the same thing to a lot of my friends and colleagues lady, lately. So ladies, you are not the problem. Like, like we've all said here today, it's not, it's not our fault. Um, when you give it your all and you don't get the results that you hoped for or expected or deserved, please don't internalize that as a personal failing. When you give it your all at work and you don't get that raise or that promotion, it's not because you lack the confidence or you lack negotiation skills or that you're too loud or that you're too quiet 
or that you have imposter syndrome. It's not because any of that. So you're being paid less because we're dealing with a legacy of inequality in the workplace. And while it may be true that you still have to work twice as hard to get that raise or that promotion or that job, you're not working twice as hard to overcome any personal deficiencies. You're working twice as hard, or likely much harder if you're a woman of color, to overcome deficiencies that exist in corporate America. So why am I telling you this? I don't want you to give up or settle when you hit a wall. I don't want you to fall into silent acceptance. Let's talk about it. During my time at Glassdoor, I've come to realize the power there is in having authentic, transparent conversations about work. And when you internalize something, you silently take that on as an individual. But when you have a conversation about it, you give others the opportunity to help fix the system. So in the course of having these conversations, you may also find that you get information and validation and power that you would not have otherwise got on your own. We're starting to see more and more companies take meaningful action to improve pay equity. Companies are becoming more aware of not just the issue, but the stigma that comes with not addressing it. And pay transparency laws are, are starting to help job seekers learn more about what they can ask for before they negotiate their salary. And workers are getting more comfortable discussing their salary with others and using sites like Blastdoor to share their pay, title, and demographic data with other professionals to help them. So let's keep this momentum going. You might be feeling like you're ready to level up your pay, or you might be feeling like giving your situation at work, it's just not worth the risk. Or you might know for a fact that you are being paid fairly. And regardless of how you're feeling right now, there's something all of us can do to advance pay equity. If you're ready to level up your pay, use sites like Glassdoor to research what you're worth and have that conversation. If you're worried about the risk, reach out to others like you in your industry and get a pulse on how they might handle it. Consider researching other companies who are taking active steps towards closing the pay gap. And if you're sure that you're maxing out your pay or you have um, more influence or sway at work, then consider sponsoring a woman at work. Consider cha championing her career and lending your voice to support her goals. And everyone here today could you help change the narrative around equal pay from an opt-in issue to an all-in issue where everyone has an important role to play? So I hope you all join the conversation on Glassdoor. Let's not let this discussion end here. And I hope you leave here feeling motivated to today to take an action, big or small, to help close the pay gap, especially if it involves giving your own paycheck a boost. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Let's have one last round of applause for all of our incredible speakers. Diane, Lovey, Reshma, thank you so much for contending to, continuing to lend your voice to support women in the workplace. Um, I hope you all got as much out of today as I did. Thanks again. <laughs>